Good morning. Good morning. Welcome home. Welcome home. We're delighted to be here with you today. Our worship theme for today, Sunday, March 26, 2023, is as follows. Gracious and loving God, bearer of good news, we gather in your holy name, grateful. We worship and wonder in your sacred presence. You hear our cries and respond to our suffering. You deliver us from bondage and offer new pathways of hope. Your abundant grace resurrects us into new beings. As instructed by you, this significant community of faith speaks and sings as your voice, saying aloud to each other, Go down, Moses. Let my people go. This is my body, which is for you. This cup is the new covenant. God of grace and glory, you use us to communicate with one another, reminding the world that we are not alone, that your love is shared, outspoken, and liberating. Amen. Amen. Let us worship the risen Christ. again. Welcome to worship with us at First Christian Church of Decatur. My name is Daniel Brower and I am the associate pastor here at First Christian. Um, we truly have an all-star cast leading us in worship today. Leading us in word is of course the Reverend Dr. James Brewer Calvert. Leading us on the keys is Adam Cole. Uh, who else have we got? Leading us at the table is myself and Reverend Phil Foster. Leading us in the Holy Scriptures today, we have Don Ely, who is a seminarian who has joined with us from Candler School of Theology. We are super, super pleased to have her with us. Leading us in prayer today is Brenda Worthy. Um, and, oh, right. Uh, leading us in special music today is an ensemble of congregation members led by the one, the only, William Garner. If you would like to join me in our welcome statement is on the back of your bulletin. We read this every um, every worship service because it is integral to who we are as a people of faith, and it behooves us to put this before us every single week and say, this is who we are. And who we are, First Christian Church of Decatur, is an opening, open and affirming congregation. We welcome everyone into full participation in the life and membership of the church. Inspired and informed by God's love, mercy, and justice, we are purposefully involved in the healing and helping of our community and our world. We covenant with God and the greater community to nurture a spirit of love and service to neighbors, honor one another's differences, and fellowship in the breaking of the bread. Actively striving to honor each other's race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, 
nationality, ethnicity, marital status, physical or mental ability, family configuration, political affiliation, economic circumstance, or theological perspective, we truly do welcome all. If you are following along with the welcome statements on the back of your bulletin, now flip over one, and boom, those are your announcements. The announcements today are as follows. Today after the service is our stewardship and deacons meeting. That's not a typo, those are both happening at the same time, and if you are interested in one or both, come and join us. It's not exclusive to the people who are elected or choose to be on that committee. Wednesday, we are having handbell choir practice. I regret to inform you that it might be a little late to get in on our Palm Sunday special, but if you start coming to practice now, you can play with us after Easter. <laughs> okay, fine, whatever. Anyway, um, March 30th, Chalice Thrift will be open their normal hours. However, on Saturday, April 1st, Chalice Thrift will be closed because the memorial service for Elizabeth Ham will be taking place at 11 a.m. on this Saturday, April 1st. Um, and then April 2nd is Palm Sunday. It's going to be a fantastic service filled with celebration and preparation for Holy Week. And it's also going to be our Easter egg stuffing party. So if you have Easter eggs that you would like to donate, or if you have candy that you would like to donate, or um, sometimes instead of candy, we put like little toys for the kids in some of the bigger Easter eggs. If you have any of that to donate, bring it over on Palm Sunday and we're gonna sit around a table and stuff eggs and it's a really great time of fun and fellowship. And maybe some of the candy gets eaten, who can say? Anyway, um, our Holy Week offerings really, really quickly. Um, April 6th, Monday, Thursday service at 7 p.m. Um, Good Friday service at 7 p.m. on 7th. If you are interested in taking a little bit more of an in-depth time of prayer and reflection on Good Friday, uh, there will be a Good Friday gathering and a retreat of silent prayer and scripture reading and meditation that will take place in the chapel from 12 to 5.30 if you are able to come and be a part of that, it's promising to be a really meaningful time of prayer and reflection. If you can't physically be a part of that for whatever reason, there are the schedule of prayer and scripture readings and the, um, the outline of what we'll be doing here is also available at the office for you to participate on your own um, at home or at work or wherever you happen to be. Yes, sir. That is very true. Thank you for pointing that out, Tom. If you can't commit to being there for the whole five and a half hours, that is okay and completely reasonable. If you want to come around for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever time that you want to take out of your day to spend this sacred space with one another, that is perfectly fine. You are not obligated to the entire time. Phil, did I miss anything? I think that's good. Thank you. Fantastic. And of course, Sunday, uh, April 9th is Easter. Any other announcements that I missed in that really quick rundown? Fabulous, okay. Then will you please stand as you are willing and able and join us in our first hymn this morning, number 623, Woke Up This Morning, number 623. <laughs>
I waited patiently for the Lord. God inclined to me and heard my cry. The Lord drew me up and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. The Spirit put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Then I said, Here I am. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Amen. Let us pray together. Benevolent Creator, here we are. Here am I. We are here again in your loving presence. We give you thanks for bringing us together as a people of liberation, a people loosed from the bonds of slavery. We give you thanks for receiving and continually transforming our captivity by your big love. Lord, we know that each person everywhere and all of us here today have suffered some form of bondage. Some of us are struggling with our bodies even now, or our hearts, or our minds, our past, our futures. Some are weary from the various types of change with which we have bound ourselves and with which we have bound others, both intentionally and unintentionally both consciously and unconsciously, all of us, everyone. In this life you have given to us to co-create with you, we rejoice in the knowing of your covenant call. We give you thanks that in the midst of our subjugations, incarcerations, manipulations, and dependencies, you speak with us empowering us, liberating us, loving us. We give you thanks that Jesus gets us, that your son, our brother and friend, knows the path of suffering. We walk that path in solidarity with him on this Lenten journey. Be with us as we seek to discern your will for us today, individually and collectively. Be with us as we seek to find courage, and strength and hope to pick up the cross and follow the Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. So, get settled. We're going to be here for a minute. We have a few scriptures to read. But let us receive the scripture passages through the Spirit so as to illuminate God's message to us this morning. So as we begin with Exodus 3, verses 1 through 14, and then we'll move on to 4, 1 through 5, and 10 through 17. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is God's name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. God said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Continuing into Exodus 4. Then Moses answered, But suppose they do not believe me or listen to me, but say, The Lord do, did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake, and Moses drew back from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. He, inde he indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand the staff with which you shall perform the signs. This is the word of the Lord. Invite our young people to come forward for their special time. All right. So, Cole, you doing okay? That did echo really well. Shall we do it again? Let's do it again. 
of God? That's, that's a tough one, right? You want to think about it? Not sure? Yeah. I bet that if I asked that to the whole congregation, a lot of people would say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But let's try this. Let's see if, um, if you have a microphone and you say, but I, I'll give it to you a second. You say, James, this is the voice of God speaking to you. Try that. That would probably sound pretty creepy. <laughs> James, this is the voice of God speaking to you. Now, now, let's try it this way. Let's try it without the mic. Okay. You have my full attention. All right. So this is this is what God does. God uses us to speak to one another. This is one of the key ways that God communicates with you and with me, with the whole people of God, is that God uses people to speak God's words to one another. Otherwise, how would we hear God's word? can't all just be inside of our heads. Sometimes people say things to you and they're speaking with the voice of God. So sometimes those voices of God come out like this. Hey Cohen, I think you're really a neat person. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a that's the kind of thing that God might do. And say a word of affirmation. Or, God might say, Hey Cohen, have you thought about doing a community service project? Hmm? I mean, I have before. You have before, yeah. right. Well, that counts. You know, there's different things that God can say to us, but it comes through other people. And we need to be listening, yes, to the holy, but also to each other. Because sometimes, the voices that we hear our holy voices. Yeah, that's heavy, right? You'd be thinking about that one. We're all going to think about that. And I'm going to tell you a few words about that in the pulpit in just a minute. Okay? All right. Let's do that high five again. May God's blessings. Ow! And peace be with you. <laughs> this is going to be a one-handed sermon, y'all. Let us pray. Father, our Father, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we come before you this morning with bow down heads and humble hearts. Father God, we come before you seeking our soul salvation. First of all, Lord, we want to ask you to forgive us of our sins, whether by word, thought, or deed. For you are a good God, you are a merciful God, you are awesome, Jesus. And then, Lord, we ask, Lord God, that you will bless each one that is under the sound of my voice. Be it here in the church, or be it being streamed. We ask, Lord God, that you will sweep by each one of us with the hem of your garment. And Father, we're praying that whatever you find, Jesus Christ, that is not of you, Lord God, we ask right now, Father God, that you will remove it from us. Father, we want to be more like you. We want to talk more like you and walk like you, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, the only way we can do that, Lord God, is that you cleanse us, Lord God. Cleanse our minds and our hearts, Jesus Christ. Teach us, Lord, how to pray, Jesus Christ. Teach us how to love one another, my Lord and my God. 
Father, we just pray for healing, Father God. But we know that somebody today don't feel well, Jesus Christ. Somebody's asking, what must I do to be saved, Lord God? And Father God, we ask that you will make us a beacon of light, Jesus Christ. And so when we run into these individuals, or they look out and see us, and they ask, what must I do to be saved? Tell me, who is Jesus? Father God, let us be ready, Jesus Christ. Let us be that voice that you need, Lord God, to, to, to take over where you have given us, Father God. We say thank you, Father God, for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to do. And Father, most of all, we thank you for what you're going to do. And Lord, at this present time, we ask you to teach us to pray as you taught your disciples, Jesus Christ. Saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we give us our temptations, but deliver us from evil. For the eyes of the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. The spiritual, which is which a musical ensemble will sing today, is Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, a beloved song for many. For me, this was one of the lullabies my mother would sing to us at bedtime, and I, in turn, sang it to my children. The biblical root of this spiritual is the chariot sweeping down to pick up Elijah and take him to heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. In its original setting among enslaved African Americans, the text carried a double meaning, as was so often the case. The singers might be focusing on God's eventual vindication of the oppressed in transcendent glory on the other side of death, and at the same time, be singing secretly about the imminent glory of the Underground Railroad in sweeping down to take yet another slave north to freedom. The Jordan River is also the Ohio. Amen. This arrangement in our chalice hymnal was provided by beloved disciples, pastor, and musician, Reverend Bill Thomas who led music at Disciples General Assemblies throughout the 90s and 2000s. Sadly, Bill passed away in 2020. Fortunately, his gifts remain. Hear and receive Swing Low, Sweet Chariot.
church today. <laughs> for the gift of music, for a chariot that carries us home, and for this heavenly choir, let the church say amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Go down, Moses. Go down, Moses. So when little Janie got home from Sunday school, her mother said, what did you learn in Sunday school this morning? And Janie said, well, mom, our teacher told us that God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And when Moses got to the Red Sea, he had his engineers build a pontoon bridge and all the people walked across to safety. And then Moses used his walkie-talkie to call in for reinforcements. And along came some bombers and they took out the pontoon bridge so the Egyptians could not follow them. Her mother said, now Janie, is that really what your Sunday school teacher taught you? Well, no, Mom. However, if I told you what she told me, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Go down, Moses. We've got a pretty good idea what was on Moses' mind, of what was uppermost in his thinking, as he pondered the situation before him. And you know that in his mind was this question, this question that was not raised, a question which was not addressed, a question which was bypassed and avoided, but it's right there in the open. God, why don't you do this yourself? Hold on, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start at the beginning. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Here's a bush that's blazing, yet it's not consumed. And in the midst, in its flames, is an angel of the Lord. The story invites us in. We can envision this through Moses' eyes. This awe of the moment. The awe of the mystery. The awe of the magic. The awe of the might of what was happening. This is not anything like we've seen before or since. Who here hasn't sat, sat around a campfire and watched as the logs burned and became hot coals? Or we've lit birthday cake candles. We've held those lit matches as long as we dared until the flame was consumed by the matchstick. And then, until the matchstick was consumed by the flame, and then we reached for another matchstick. So when Moses came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, he rounded a corner and encountered a bush on fire. And at first glance to him, to us, it appears this is a forest fire. Where's Smokey the bear when you need him? But a second look, however, revealed that the bush is on fire, but it is not consumed. Furthermore, standing in the epicenter of this flame is an angel of the Lord. We're invited to join Moses as he enters the realm of nigh to impossible. Flames dancing, yet not destroying. A conflagration that burns but does not consume. A divine messenger surrounded by tongues of flame, speaking and calling to Moses by name. Surely, my friends, we are intimately, warmly invited to be in awe with Moses. To experience this moment. To witness that we are in sacred space for a living God who will not be contained. Go down, Moses. We move in with Moses for a closer inspection. His, his very thought process is revealed in the Bible. 
I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer. Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So far, so good. Nothing drastic, other than a very bright and warm miracle. There's a little mystery, there's a little might. This is a divine reminder of the sudden presence of the God who will not be contained. Of a God who has the power to burn, yet not consume. Who knows the name of this shepherd. Who testifies that this is a deity like no other. Here is the one true God who insists that sandals be removed. Respect bestowed. Faces turn aside. Because wherever the Lord is present and accounted for is holy ground. The Holy One identifies as the God of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. Immediately we know that the, what Moses knows, that this is the same Lord who showed abundant compassion and a sense of justice to his ancestors. So far, so good. Introductions are complete. There's no need to worry, be overly concerned. God said, in effect, to Moses, and across time and space, across generations, speaking to us today, now I have your attention. This is what it took, but I have your attention. I've told you who I am. I have a history. It's been documented. I have a record of compassion and grace and justice. I will not be contained, for I am a living God. And God, having concluded all the niceties, now gets down to business. And the business at hand is suffering. Human suffering. Human suffering and relationships. Human suffering and relationships and what God and you and I and Moses are going to do about it. Recently at the Decatur Book Festival, Christian ethicist Dr. David Gushy said, I believe that the truest human language is tears. The truest human language is tears. And the best test of human beings is how they respond to tears. Go down, Moses. Moses' heart must have leapt with relief, with joy, with gratitude, when God spoke the next word. Upon the mountain of God, the Lord spoke through the fire, saying, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites. My Lord and my God, thank you, Jesus. This is sacred music to the ears of people of faith, of people who are hurt and hurting. If the promise of a land of milk and honey seemed too good to be true, that would have been beside the point. The God of the incredible burning bush cared about Israel and about justice and about protecting those who could not protect themselves. And that made all the difference. Yes, indeed. Moses witnessed up close and personal the sufferings of his people, the Hebrew people. He personally understood all about being marginalized, about being oppressed, 
about being distressed, about being repressed, about being forced to labor at a task not of his choosing while others profited, of the indignity of income and wage inequality. And if you want to look around America to a city with the greatest income and wage inequality, don't have to look any further than our front yard, because Atlanta is number one. He knew the power and the promise of God to save, to deliver, to redeem, to love. And that has made all the difference. We too know the pangs of compassion, of deep pathos for the broke and the broken. We know what it's like to have our heartstrings played for the hurts and the dashed hopes of our neighbors in need. And we say to each other again and again and again in this significant congregation, the question before us is never, who is my neighbor? The question is always, what does my neighbor need? Say that with me. What does my neighbor need? That makes all the difference. I love the story of the mother with the two children, age five and three. Kevin's five, Ryan's three, and she's serving them pancakes. And the boys begin to argue over who's going to get the first pancake. And she sees this opportunity, you know, a teachable moment for a lesson in morality. And she says, you know, if Jesus was here, he'd say, why don't you have the first pancake? So Kevin, who's five, turns to Ryan, who's three, and says, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> Go down, Moses. Then, my family, my friends, suddenly the other shoe drops. This Exodus story flips. It changes. It goes down this rabbit hole because it erases any distance, any chance of we and thee of being removed or remote, detached or disconnected from God and each other. And it's God who drops the shoe. Because God said, so come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And the Lord said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Consider, call, chosen, selected to liberate the oppressed, to speak with the very voice and words of God to the powers that be. Moses responds and he raises not one, not two, not three, not four, but five objections. Five objections. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Number one, I'm not qualified. If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of our ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Number two, I lack sufficient knowledge to fulfill my calling. Number three, but suppose they do not believe me or listen to me. Huh, I lack the power to do what you are asking. Four. Oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. This is a calling for someone more qualified than me. Number five, oh, my Lord, this is the best. Please send someone else. In other words, number five, I'd rather not. Five times God calls Moses to go forth. Go down, Moses. Go down to Egypt land. Speak for God. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Five times God responds to Moses' doubts and wonderings, his fears, his faltering faith, his insecurities, and his hesitancies. Five times God acts in Moses' life to fill him with courage to assuage his fears, provide compadres for the journey, 
to give him a bribe as a sign of power, and to remind him to keep the faith. Do not fear, Pharaoh, for I will be with you. Go down, Moses. And now we return to that opening question, that unanswered, unaddressed question that Moses brought up in his head. There were five objections, but there's a question that is not raised. The chances are that Moses was on the verge of asking God, why don't you do this yourself? That's our question so often. Why don't you do this yourself? Why ask me? Why not do this yourself? And God responded, come with me. I need your voice. Come with me to Asian nations where monsoons are overwhelming, to many precious families with too few precious resources. Come with me and see how they pull together to rescue a mother from a tree. Come with me to advocate for those whose human rights and civil rights are being repudiated, refused, and rebuffed. Come with me to where state legislatures across America are oppressing and limiting civil rights, the rights of women, the rights of the LGBTQ plus community, the rights of people of color. Come with me to passionately and persistently speak the truth and love to the principalities and powers. Come with me, Moses and my people. You may want to say, not me, Lord. Why don't you do this yourself? Yet, says God, your vocal cords, your daring bodies are called to be there as well. For we shall overcome. Go down, Moses. Way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Sarah Bradford had an opportunity to interview Harriet Tubman. And in 1869, she published the authorized autobiography of Harriet Tubman. It's called Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman. She quotes Tubman as saying that she used the spiritual Go Down Moses as one of two code songs used with fugitive enslaved people, used to communicate them, to help them to flee to, out of Maryland and to go north. Tubman began her underground railroad work in 1850 and freed some 400 people, and she continued until the beginning of the Civil War. Some people hypothesized that it may have been Harriet Tubman herself who wrote, Go Down Moses. And other people wonder if it was Nat Turner, one of the most well-known slave revolt leaders in history, but regardless of who wrote and who was the inspiration for Go Down Moses, either way, regardless of who gets the credit, we sing. We sing. We proclaim. We speak. We sing aloud to each other a word of instruction. Go down, Moses. A message of a mission. Go down, Moses. A cry for deliverance. Let my people go. Liberate, free, deliver. As instructed by God, this significant community of faith speaks and sings with a divinely inspired voice. We say aloud to each other, go down, Moses, let my people go. And I know that you've picked up on the fact that when we gather at the communion table and the leader offers us the words of institution, that the leader is the narrator, and the people of God are the voice of Christ. That we are the voices of God, saying to each other, this is my body, which is for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Our God of grace and God of glory uses us, yes, uses us to communicate with one another reminding the world that we are not alone, that God's big love is shared, outspoken, and liberating, and that we are the voice. 
Betty and I watch this show. This is the voice. I always hear that in my head. But it's, we are the voice. We are the voice of God. Go down, Moses. Go down. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered one of the greatest, most memorable speeches spoken aloud 60 years ago at the Lincoln Memorial as part of the 1963 March on Washington. It was a hot, sweltering, humid day. My dad was there, by the way. He was part of 250,000 people who came to hear King speak on the cause of civil rights. What most of us don't know is that that famous I have a dream speech almost didn't happen. That that dream part of the speech almost never happened. In fact, it should not have happened because it was not in his manuscript that he had in front of him on the pulpit, on the lectern, on the Lincoln Memorial. <coughs> but that day of 1963, Mahalia Jackson was a few feet away just behind him she had already raised her divinely inspired voice. And King paused in his sermon. He delivered his manuscript part. And Mahalia Jackson shouted for him to hear, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. It's one of the world's greatest gospel singers calling out to one of the world's greatest preachers of all time. Clarence Jones was nearby, and he recalled that Martin Luther King took the, the lectern manuscript and he pushed it aside, and he grabbed the lectern, and he looked out at his 250,000 people, and Clarence Jones turned to a friend of his, because he'd heard the I Have a Dream speech at a church recently, and he said, these people out there, they don't know it but they're about to get ready to build a church. This speaks to the genius and the boldness of Mahalia Jackson, willing in one of the biggest moments of her life in Dr. King's to speak up with a great idea. How wonderful it was that King did not scoff at her or ignore her. He chose to listen for this was the voice of God. <clears throat> Tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. And so he said, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true creed, the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. All power be to Creator, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
think stewardship has something to do with noticing with paying attention do you love spring I love spring no I mean I really love spring I was walking out of my apartment building to the parking lot the other day and I had this amazing experience of gratitude quite unexpected I've lived to see another spring. How miraculous is that? How, how much is God's call in that? The greens. Do you know how many greens there are in the world? There are more greens than I can possibly imagine. My apartment is on the 14th floor here in Decatur. I look out over the tree line. There are more greens than you can possibly imagine. There's such an abundance of shades, so many ways, so many ways that life manifests. I feel so humble and so rich. If you pause and notice this abundance, if you have noticed the continual outpouring of God's love into life and yes, in your life, then uh, we invite you to steward some of your green with us. These are the jokes, folks. Uh, James is a tough act to follow. We invite you to participate with your resources to the ministries of First Christian Church Decatur. You'll find a box on the windowsill of the sanctuary. You may also give online at um, decaturdisciples.org or you may go to your bulletin. There's a QR code in there and we are happy to have your resources in whatever form they come. Thank you. Like Moses, we encounter our excuses, our other plans, our emptiness. God, I am so small. There's a wonderful little poem from the Sufi poet Rumi. Would you like to hear it? I'll take that as an affirmation. Very short little poem. How can this great love be inside of me? Say it again. How can this great love be inside of me? I am so small. Well, look at your eyes. They're small. And look at the great things that they see. I personally have all kinds of feelings of inadequacy, fears, doubts, even at 72 going on 73, maybe even more so in some ways. And like Moses, I, we are utterly and completely dependent on God. Today's gospel reading from the lectionary is uh, taken from John's gospel. It's the story of Lazarus, which most of you know. A quick refresher. When the friend of Jesus, Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, dies, he emerges alive from the tomb at Jesus' cry, Lazarus, come out. And do you recall what Jesus says next? What does Jesus say next? Unbind him and let him go. Unbind him, let him go. This table embodies that ultimate giving it's the continual outpouring of God's big love 
on which all creation and yes each one of our lives is dependent for our very existence in him we have our being this table is the liberation of humanity and all creation as we wander during this Lent consciously entering the desert of our own hearts roaming through our busy lives with distractions and deep desires and longings and our egoic wants I must, I should, I think, I feel I, 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 I. and yes even our longing for the promised land for the dream let us heed Lord Jesus' admonition to remember who he is, his sacrifice and liberating love, and to remember who we are. We are his sisters and brothers, a family of choice manifesting the image of God within each of us and in all things everywhere. All are welcome at this table, which is God's, as we say in our welcoming statement, everyone is honored here, everyone, regardless of our identities or our ideologies that we embody and that we believe separates us. At this table, that illusion of separateness vanishes. God does away with that illusion at this table we are not separate, we are one, and sin is healed forever. We celebrate communion by intention, you will come, take a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and partake. If you prefer not to come forward, there are individual communion cups on the sides and in the rear of the church. If you cannot get up to get one, one of the deacons will bring you one. If you feel called not to partake, we invite you to enter the silence of your own heart and reflect on Lord Jesus' sacrifice and God's eternal and unfailing love for us. Let us pray. Lord God, you remind us through the poets that we are alive because you want us to be. We are here because you want us to be here. You desire to enter into a relationship with us and we desire to be in relationship with you. As you called Lazarus, you call us to come forth to this table. Let us come to this table to fellowship together and be unbound from the things that hold us back so that then you can tell us as you told Moses to go. God, let us go. Let us be your voice in this world. May this table strengthen us to take that word of freedom to all the land. Be with us as we partake in this supper in remembrance of you. In your name we pray. Amen. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a simple loaf of bread. He blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his friends and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember the Lord until he comes again.
May we pray together. God, our help, we thank you for this supper, shared in the spirit with your son Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all good gifts in him, and pledge ourselves to serve you, even as in Christ you have served us. Amen. If you will join us for our last hymn, our hymn of going forth, it's going to be number 633, Lead On, O Cloud of Presence. Number 633, please stand as you are willing and able. church today. We've had church today. We might go another couple hours. It's one of those pieces where I didn't know when to come up, you know. It kept moving and moving. I love it. I hope you record that and claim it. 
So, folks, we want to thank our worship leaders. Yes, we did have our A team today. It was so good. Thank you to the choir. Thank you to our scripture leaders and our prayer people and communion. Just a beautiful service. And thank you to you and all. May you go forth and speak with the voice of God. For the world needs to hear God's voice. Amen. Go forth and speak truth to power. Speak it in love. Speak it with grace. Go forth with the grace of God. And may the God of grace go with you. And the whole people of God said together, Amen. Amen.